Another artistic movement that sort of rises with World War I is the international movement called Dada. Um, it was international. There were two major centers for it. One was in Switzerland in Zurich, so Zurich Dada. And then there was German Dada. Um, the Dada that emerges in Switzerland, in Zurich, actually emerges first in about 1915, primarily as a literary movement, though there are, were visual artists involved. Um, and this was a group of people who started hanging out at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. Um, they were interested in some things maybe that we've seen with futurism. For example, um, Dada um, looked down on the conventions and traditions of the past. And there was this idea that you needed to overthrow um, what old notions of art were. And part of that was really because of the chaos wrought by World War I. Um, you know, this was a huge spectacle of death and destruction on a global scale. And there's this idea that, you know, man's logic and reason and science had brought him to this horrific place and that therefore maybe the only thing that can save man was to turn towards anarchy and the intuitive and the irrational. Um, like the futurists, not only did they disdain the past, but they also um, wrote their manifestos. And it said really something about the movement. And here is a passage from the Dada Manifesto. It says, Dada knows everything. Dada spits on everything. Dada says no thing. Dada has no fixed ideas. Dada does not catch flies. Dada is bitterness laughing at everything that has been accomplished, sanctified. Dada is never right. No more painters, no more writers, no more religions, no more royalists, no more anarchists, no more socialists, no more police, no more airplanes, no more urinary passages. Like everything in life, Dada is useless. Everything happens in a completely idiotic way. We are incapable of treating seriously any subject whatsoever, let alone this subject, ourselves. So you have this sense of the overthrow of everything. And the Dada's, Dadaists were interested in psychoanalysis, especially the thoughts of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. They were interested in the subconscious mind, which is something they're going to share with the surrealists in the future. And they were interested in chance. Their works had a sense of humor um, and some sense of the absurd. So as we said, their works were both literary and visual, but it wasn't just about things like painting and sculptures. They did absurd theatrical performances. They did chance paintings. They gave nonsense lectures. The term itself, Dada, um, has unclear origins. The most common story that is told was that um, the word was chosen when a French, French German dictionary was opened at random and it came to the word Dada, which was the name for um, a child's hobby horse or like a rocking horse, um, which is both sort of traditional and nonsensical. But um, other proposals have been put forth. It's simply that maybe in French, Dada just refers to a hobby or an obsession. Other people related it to the word yes, like da, 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 um, as something that was heard um, amidst, amidst the Dadaists. Um, so we'll take a look at a few works of both Dada painting and sculpture with these ideas in mind. A great work to explain the aesthetics of Dada would be this work called Untitled or more specifically collage with squares arranged according to the laws of chance. Let me guess which one you're going to write on a test um, by Jean Arp. And he was the major, most important visual artist to come out of Zurich Dada. Um, he's actually born in Strasbourg. He um, discovers modern painting when he goes to Paris and he was both a poet and a painter. Um, he does, by the way, come into contact with um, Kandinsky and Blaue Reiter, um, but he starts making these works, which I said become emblematic of 
of Dada, um, he met another artist whose name was Sophie Tauber, and they start working together. And they started making these images together, which were these chance collages. So the idea was that, I mean, the story behind it certainly is that um, Arp was working on a cubist collage and he was frustrated with his work. And so he tore it up really rough, just tore it up and threw it on the floor and then glued them onto the arrangement in which they fell. Um, so we can see maybe this still reference obviously to the geometry of cubism, but now we see something else at play, which is this idea of um, anarchy and subversiveness, the idea that the artist is relinquishing control and suppressing his personal style, um, and sort of distancing himself from creative process and instead allowing um, chance to guide the way that the work appeared. This is something that the Dada artists did in other circumstances. For example, there were Dada poets who used this same technique where they, you know, took little pieces of paper with words on them and threw them on the floor. Um, and wrote poetry in that way, right? So that chance would guide the poetry. Um, you can see though, at the same time, this is what is said is happening in this work, that he's not just, you know, in influencing the work at all. In fact, when he did more of these um, collages, and as I said, so, and he did them in some case as collaborations with his wife, um, he actually even suppressed the hand of the artist even more. And in later ones, he didn't even hand rip the paper. He used a paper cutter to get machine cut lines. So it showed no evidence of the artist's control. And Arp, when he painted, didn't use things like impasto, like he wasn't trying to show the artist's hand. On the other hand, you can see this tension between, um, you know, the sort of cubist grid and this sense of chance in the work. And you can also sense that even though um, this has some randomness to it, um, there is a conscious arrangement here, you know, that really did play a role. Like this doesn't entirely look like an accidental composition. But certainly the notion that chance and randomness would play a role in painting was a new element that came with this increased interest in things like psychoanalysis and something that was also going to be important when we look at the work of the surrealists. Now Dada, and in fact, a lot of European modernism first really made its impression on America in 1913. And that's when a group of about two dozen young artists who called themselves the Association of American Painters and Sculptors decided to host an exhibition in New York City. And so there were two artists really at the front of organizing it, um, Walt Kuhn and Arthur B. Davies. And they ended up um, corralling more than 1,600 works by American and European artists. And you see some of their names here, but they included works by Matisse and Duran and Picasso and Brock and Duchamp and Kandinsky and Kirchner, um, other artists that we're going to be looking at. And they t undertook this massive exhibition so they use the building, the New York National Guard's 69th Regiment building, their armory. And so for that reason, we now call it the Armory Show. And these artists, you know, raised the money, they generated publicity, they moved the art, they rented the building, and they hung this exhibition all without any exterior public funding. 87,000 visitors saw it in New York City, and then it would, went on afterwards to Chicago and Boston. At the exhibition, um, one work of art became sort of the poster child for the exhibition, and it was a work by the artist Marcel Duchamp, who at that point was a young artist, and four of his works were included in the show. Now, Marcel Duchamp was only 26 years old in 1913 at the time of the Armory show, but he was a sort of radical revolutionary artist. He rejected a lot of what he saw in modern art as being what he called retinal, which meant it was really only in service of the eyes. It was for the eyes, which think about how much art we could describe that way. Things like certainly Monet or the post-impressionists like Seurat 
whereas he thought that art needed to be put back in service of the mind. And it was one of Duchamp's paintings that really became sort of the poster child for modern art in America and the poster child for the Armory Show. Now, it was this work by Marcel Duchamp, his nude descending a staircase, that became the poster child for the sort of madness of modern art and came to represent the Armory Show in 1913 in New York City. It's an interesting work because Marcel Duchamp is both confronting tradition and sort of combating tradition, which is something we see a lot of modernist artists like the futurists do. So on the one hand, he's looking back into the past to the subject of a nude descending a staircase. The nude was is the oldest subject in the history of art. Um, he certainly was looking back to the more recent artistic movements of both Cubism and Futurism as well. In terms of Cubism, we can see the use of three-dimensional forms flattened into geometric shapes. We can see some reference to shading. Um, and we even can see the monochromatic palette that Picasso and Brock both liked. We can also see an interest in things that the futurists did in this sort of interest, obviously, in dynamism, the interest in looking at figures in motion. Um, and in fact, you can see something very similar to what we saw with Bala's experiments with the chrono photographs with that the idea of motion with this figure. It's as if we see the same figure descending the staircase and that the movement is like stop action, the sort of cinematic quality that um, Mary and Moybridge, the photographers, were playing with at the same time. But it has a greater amount of, of humor certainly than what we can see in futurist work. There's this kind of wit to it. Um, and Duchamp was an interesting character. He didn't paint a whole lot. That He makes this work when he's 26 years old and he doesn't paint that much after it. So it's really his earliest career is when he had these, these moments of painting. And in 1915, he publishes his own sort of manifesto. At least he writes what he thinks about art. It was a statement that was called A Complete Reversal of Art Opinions by Marcel Duchamp Iconoclast. So Duchamp calls himself an iconoclast. An iconoclast um, is somebody who destroys images, right? Iconoclasm is the destruction of images. An icon is an image. So when we use the term iconography, we're talking about image writing or image symbols. So the word icon we use again and again. An iconoclast destroys images, which is seems to us a strange thing for a painter to call himself as someone who destroys rather than creates images. But in a larger sense, it has to do with this idea of destroying the traditions of the past. You know, he said that he wanted to put painting in the service of the mind. The title, by the way, is very traditional. It seems almost literary, the new descending a staircase. And he writes the title on the work at the bottom edge of the picture, which is another sort of idea that points towards cubism and the idea of layering text over the image. Other than that, we can see this figure set into motion. You can see the artist playing with lines of movement, these sort of force lines, creating the swing of the lower leg and these dotted lines that look like the movement of the hip as the figure sort of moves in this staccato pace down the stairs. Now, the work was seen as absolute madness when it was painted. And just like we've seen other works of it, you know, think about looking at the Dejeuner sur l'herbe, the way that a single work can become sort of emblematic for an exhibition and the object of ridicule. Well, that fell to Duchamp's painting. So here you can actually see um, from a newspaper from the Evening Sun in 1913, uh, the Seeing New York with a Cubist cartoon, which was called The Rude Descending a Staircase, Rush Hour at the Subway, where you see the body pile of bodies falling on top of each other. The picture was described as pathological. It was called a menace to public morality. Um, and, and it was famously described by one critic as an explosion in a shingle factory. So the critics responded poorly, even though it became um, this symbol for 
everything that was sort of modern and sort of machine aesthetic in a way, but again, with that sense of satirical humor. What is interesting about it is, you know, despite the fact that this work was much maligned by the critics, Marcel Duchamp sells this picture. I think he sells all four works of art that he had exhibited at the Armory shows. In fact, we found the sales ledger that shows that the picture sold this one for $324 and that Duchamp received $240 after the commission was paid. And that's a modern equivalent of more than $5,500, which was pretty good for a 26 year old artist who was completely unknown in America. But Duchamp's most famous work was actually not a painting, but rather in a sense, a work of sculpture. But actually it's the type of sculpture that we refer to as a ready-made. And Duchamp actually was said to have invented the ready-made as an idea in 1913, even before the exhibition of this work in 1917. Now the idea of a ready-made really, you can see is an extension of the idea of collage. In collage, you take objects that were not made by the artist and they can be integrated into a work of art. So Picasso could take the printed chair caning on oil cloth and cut it out and make it part of his object. And ready-mades often and collage have this notion of low art things becoming high art, like sequins on a picture. In this case, it kind of follows the same notion, which is to say, um, this is an object that is a urinal. It is an everyday object of plumbing, which Duchamp has chosen as an artwork. And therefore it is what we call a ready-made. So now I'll give you some context for this. Um, Duchamp was a member of the Society of Independent Artists and they were having an exhibition in 1917. And this was a group that really prided themselves on being free from like, you know, traditional taste and convention. But when this work was submitted, the board refused it. Now, Duchamp doesn't really submit it under his own name. You could see that he signs it R. Mutt and dates it 1917, which apparently was sort of a joke derived from the name of the Mott's Plumbing Company and also maybe a joke on the name of the Mutt and Jeff um, comic strip team. So it was a little bit of a joke name and he signs it with a false name. Um, and submits it. But irregardless of whether he signed it or not, um, there were limits, I suppose, for some people about what art could be. And there was the idea, even amongst members of the avant-garde, that a work of art had to have an artist who made it. And in this case, Duchamp is presenting a commercially, reprodu commercially produced urinal that simply upended 90 degrees, which in a sense takes away its um, function and renders it a new kind of object, signs it and places it in a gallery. So that is what we call a ready-made. It is a, it's a manufactured, mass-produced object, sometimes modified or corrected in some way by the artist, as you could see here with a signature and with a change in orientation. But it shows the artist sort of declaring a total freedom from the conventions that had existed before. Now, interestingly, he submits the work anonymously and it gets rejected. So in this case, what Duchamp ends up doing is he writes a defense of Mutt's work in a magazine called The Blind Man. So this was Duchamp writing, but he's defending this artist R. Mutt, which of course we know was Duchamp himself. And this is what Duchamp wrote. They say that any artist paying $6 may exhibit Mr. Richard Mutt sent in a fountain. Without discussion, this article disappeared and was never exhibited. What were the grounds for refusing Mr. Mutt's fountain? One, some contended that it was immoral, vulgar. Two, others, it was a plagiarism, a plain piece of plumbing. Now, Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral. That is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It is a fixture that you see every day in plumber store windows. 
whether mr mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance he chose it he took an ordinary article of life placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view created a new thought for that object as for plumbing that is absurd the only works of art america has given are her plumbing and her bridges so a rather scathing reply but an interesting one that suggests that an artist doesn't need to make something an artist just needs to create a new thought for the object duchamp ended up by the way resigning um, from the society of independent artists over this work um, by the way the original you may notice was lost so the first photograph i showed you is is a second version which is now in philadelphia this is a photograph that actually shows the original fountain photographed by stieglitz the photographer um, before it was lost another artist who very much falls into this duchampian mode is the philadelphia artist uh, man ray whose name was emmanuel radinsky by birth so he's an american artist but he's working too closely with duchamp and he's very much interested in the idea of the ready-made and working with the found object um, he was trained as an architect architectural draftsman and an engineer um, and he did some really interesting things that almost ha that have this very dada spirit to it um, for example um, he began to create paintings he was the first artist we know of to create paintings using an airbrush technique which he called them aerographs um, which he really liked the idea because he could paint a picture without touching the canvas so again just like the same way you see our you know machine cutting the paper or you know cutting them with a, a paper cutter rather than a, than ripping them to make them less personalized we see that same idea here and he's also did things like you know he held a gallery art opening and he filled the room with balloons so that you had to pop them in order to discover the art now man Ray is known for um, quite a few different kinds of things he made paintings he made sculptures movies and he was known as a photographer but i'm showing you here one of his ready-mades but this is not a traditional kind of ready-made the way that um, duchamp's fountain is and that it is a ready-made it was a urinal simply displaced and turned into a new orientation this is something that was labeled as an assisted ready-made which means it was made of commercially manufactured objects but they were arranged together and manipulated in some way um, so they are mass-produced objects um, but he presents them in such a way so that um, their function and just like the urinal is a functional object that Duchamp subverts by making it not functional the same thing can be said here for this flat iron um, with a row of tacks affixed to the bottom so the story of how he did this was that um, Man Ray had an opening at the Library 6, which was a bookstore, in 1921. And at some point in the evening, he left with a stranger. Um, and he found out that the stranger was an American composer whose name was Eric Satie. Um, they eventually returned to the Library 6 with this new ready-made, which was this flat iron with the tacks on the bottom of it. They literally went out, Duchamp bought the uh, objects, the items for it, constructed it, and added it to the exhibition. Um, whether or not it has any meaning, I mean, the object seems very ominous, and it certainly has lost its original function but some people think of it maybe as a pun on the flat iron building in new york city um, but in any case it is very duchampian you know that's a good word that we can use we see him you know subverting convention we see him sort of relinquishing his role as a creator to simply work with pre-manufactured objects um, the original object kind of like Duchamp's fountain we no longer have so when this was shown at that first exhibition this disappeared um, but he had a photograph of it from that time from 1921 um, which means he either 
photographed it before it disappeared or replicated it shortly thereafter. And so the versions of it now that we see are even replicas of those, which would seem like that means it's not an original object, but the way that the Dadaists were thinking about ready-mades, the idea of originality wasn't that important. And since we're thinking about the Dadaists as painters and as sculptors, I just wanted to point out that they were, in fact, photographers too. And Man Ray was a photographer and was sort of obviously famous for his invention of what was called the rayograph, which in a totally Dadaist spirit was a photographic technique that apparently appeared sort of accidentally. Um, it was a cameraless photographic technique. So the idea was that this was using light sensitive paper with objects placed on it so that it was exposed then directly to light and that Man Ray could um, manipulate the way the images appeared by um, moving them or removing them. And so here you can see a variety of objects. You can see some thumbtacks and a coil of wire or a spring and some other objects. Um, but it has this very sort of ghost-like, strangely abstract quality. So that's very much in keeping with this idea of chance as a way to create image, the sort of idea of the ready-made, but now turned into a photographic process. Um, and so Man Ray, honestly, we think of him more as a photographer than anything else. So this is one of his many rayographs in this style. The last group we're going to look at quickly today, which is unfair because this is a fascinating group of artists, are really artists that were more responding to World War I in the wake of World War I, um, even more so in the 1920s as German politics begin shifting more towards the right. Um, a lot of these artists became dissatisfied um, with the political situation. And so what, what emerged was a new kind of picture, new kind of painting that really looked towards social realism. So again, this is a political art. Um, it's art with a lot of disturbing images in it. And three fascinating artists who are at the helm of the movement, which are George Gross, Otto Dix, and Max Beckmann. They are different, as you're going to see in terms of style, but you know, they do sort of collaborate in this group, which was called Neue Sachlichkeit, or New Objectivity. Um, so the first artist we're going to look at is George Gross. Now, I just put up this picture while we talk a little bit about Gross, um, because he really is a sort of fascinating artist. Um, even though sometimes he's presented as being more or less self-trained, he does study um, in Dresden and Berlin. Um, he's an artist who, in the second decade of the 20th century, he traveled quite a bit. So he went, well, certainly at least to Dresden and Berlin, but he also goes to Paris. He was fascinated by big cities, um, especially Berlin, where he was going to spend most of his career until um, the 1930s when he relocates for most of the rest of his life to the United States where he fell in love with New York City. Um, I just put up this picture of him because I thought it gives you an idea of his personality. On the left hand side is a photograph of George Gross with his uh, girlfriend, Ava Peter. And you can see she's posing so that she's admiring herself. She's looking in this mirror while he is hiding, um, unseen behind the mirror, holding a knife threatening her. Um, and I put this up next to a 19th century, sorry, a 16th century painting by the German painter Hans Baldung Green, um, who made famous these type of pictures, which were called Memento Mori or reminders of death. They were all images about the vanity of human existence. And in both of these, you see the woman looking in the mirror while there's the threat of her death that she doesn't see. Um, so again, we see these artists playing with the past and playing with the German past. And I said this gives you some sense of his personality uh, because there are stories of 
gross walking around the streets of Berlin dressed as death. So he was an eccentric type, and he apparently often got into trouble with authorities. Um, he does serve in the war, but he despised the war because of what he'd seen and its horrors. Um, he was in the army for two years between 1914 and 16, and then he was recalled to the army in 1917, and that experience led him to a mental breakdown, and he ended up in 1917 um, briefly in an asylum. Um, after the war, he ends up <clears throat> joining the German Communist Party. And as I said, in 1933, to escape the Nazis and Nazi persecution, he fled to the United States. And he only returned um, the year before his death to the city of Berlin. And he saw America as this sort of dream come true, especially after the horrors and the situation that he'd seen in Germany. You know, Gross actually changes the way he spells his name from G-R-O-S-S, -S, which was more German, um, to G-R-O-S-Z, which was a way to sort of disassociate himself with the madness he saw going on in Germany. And he is a fascinating artist, although we're just going to look at this one picture by him, a pretty early work, which is called The Funeral, or Homage to Oscar Panizza. So Panizza was a psychiatrist and an avant-garde writer who got himself into trouble with the authorities. He was apparently charged with blasphemy and crimes against public decency um, for his writings, which were anti-clerical, anti-authority. They rallied against both church and state. He had violent writings. And he ultimately was um, committed to an asylum in 1904. And, and Gross had been as well. So there was that aspect of them in common. Um, this work, though, shows a funeral procession in a town. Um, and you could see the inspiration from Gross from, you know, the art that would he, he saw while he was in Paris, which was the art of the Cubists and the Futurists. So we see this very sort of Cubist treatment of um, the space, you know, it's, everything is sort of here built upon this grid, but then it's got that dynamic aspect, this sort of violent chaos that we associate with uh, futurism. So we're looking at this perspectival view down the street, but it, like an artist like De Kirigo, the perspective is all askew, which gives us this great sense of tension. Um, so there's a sort of rushing perspective creating by all of these diagonal lines. Uh, Gross actually wrote to a friend while he was working on this work. He called the work a picture about mankind gone mad. And he said this, At the moment, I am painting a giant picture of hell, a gin lane of the grotesque dead and lunatics. There's a lot happening in it. The devil himself rides sideways on a coffin through the picture down to the left. And on the right, a youngster wretches and vomits all the wonderful illusions of youth into the canvas. I've dedicated the picture to Oscar Panizza, a swarm of possessed human animals. And Gross said that the figures represented alcohol and syphilis and pestilence. Now, as an inspiration for Gross's work, first of all, you might think back to Enser, because he does have these mask-like sort of carnivalesque figures in his chaotic scene where, you know, elements get lost in it. So it reminds us a lot of like what we saw when we looked at Enser. Um, but there's also older references to it, apocalyptic paintings from the 16th century, most notably the works of Peter Bruegel the Elder, which, by the way, we also used Bruegel as, an, as a comparison when we talked about Enser. So you see what they all have in common. Bruegel's picture, which is of the triumph of death, actually shows... Um, the end of the world, and you can see the figure of death riding his pale horse through the through the sort of left hand side of the scene, and then all of the dead bodies. And and Gross has a similar feature here, and you can see that there is the seated skeleton on top of a coffin. So it's a big funeral procession, and he's swigging some alcohol from a bottle, um, and so that is the sort of comparative figure of death. Otherwise, we're simply supposed to see 
um, you know, this world of, of chaos and he loved the city, but he's also showing the decrepit nature of the city. And so here, this is the gin alley he describes. You could see that there are dance halls. There's a sign on the dance hall saying dance tonight, dancing tonight. Um, you could see bars and cafes, all this brilliant fiery red, sort of like fauvist color put towards very expressive, violent purposes. And then you can see the lone building of the church amidst all of this, surrounded by office buildings and bars and nightlife. Um, we can see a couple recognizable figures like this very heavily decorated military figure raising a what looks like a bloodied sword and blowing a bugle. So he's helping to lead the procession. And there is his mocking of the military. And on the other side, we see his mocking of the clergy, as you see um, this sort of ineffective priest um, raising raising his his cross into the air again, also at the beginning of the procession. And some of the figures have sort of animalistic, almost sheep like heads um, as a way of showing that this is the masses being sheep. So fascinating picture with a very sort of cynical view. Um, and you can see, you know, that this is just supposed to be this carnival of sex and death and drunkenness. But, you know, this idea of a medieval kind of picture about death, but planted on the streets of Berlin. Now, Max Beckmann was maybe the most of the famous sort of widely known artists who are associated with new objectivity. Um, he was born in Leipzig. Um, he goes to Paris early on where he comes sort of under the orbit of artists like Cezanne. So his early works were actually quite impressionist, but like a lot of the German artists that we talked about, he was very interested in the works of the past, of the Middle Ages and of the Renaissance, particularly artists of the sort of German Renaissance. Um, like Gross, he serves in the war, but in fact, he, he volunteered for medical, like as a medical orderly, so that he could avoid combat. But he actually was um, sent to a spot that was very close to the front line, and he was completely traumatized from what he saw. He said that serving in the war brought a great injury to his soul. And eventually he was discharged in 1915 after he suffered a nervous breakdown. Um, he doesn't write a whole lot about his art. He did say some things. He wrote from the front while he was serving that drawing what was what was keeping him from death. Um, but he doesn't write a lot about his art, though he did make one statement, sort of an artistic mission statement of his. But he said that he he loved painting because it forced one to be objective. And he said, there's nothing I hate more than sentimentality. He said, I do not weep. Tears are despicable to me and signs of slavery. Um, as an artist, after the war, his images show this sort of um, anxiety that he felt and, you know, from his experiences in the war. So his art was not very politically oriented, um, but certainly sort of responds to violence and brutality, kind of in the way that we see with Gross. Um, he, by the way, was a renowned painter of the self-portrait. So we have more than 85 of him, which is probably more than any most, not, I won't say more than any, but it's a very high number in a, as a 20th century artist. And I'm just showing you one here for, for your entertainment. Um, in 1933, when the Nazis came to power, he lost his teaching position um, in Frankfurt and his works were subject to confiscation by the Nazis as degenerate art. So 590 of his works, which show you the success that he had at that point, were taken from the German museums and confiscated. And in fact, he and his wife fled Germany on the opening day of the 1937 degenerate art show in Munich. So they left, they went to Amsterdam first, and then finally, like Gross, he settled in America, where he um, had a teaching position at, would you believe, in St. Louis, in Missouri, um, at uh, Washington University. So I was actually surprised when I was in St. Louis, and I was like, there are so many Gross paintings, I'm sorry, Be Beckmann paintings in uh, the museum, and then I realized why that was. Uh, Beckmann's post-war images are images that are 
full of horror showing scenes of torture and scenes of murder often not in a very specific way in other words his imagery wasn't necessarily related to the war but certainly his imagery was fed by his own experiences so when he was um, working near the front in operating theaters he would make drawings of you know injured bodies and wound make drawings of the wounded which originally he felt sort of immune to and as we saw over time um, it changed the way Beckman saw the world um, or maybe not Beckman actually actually wrote from the front he said so the war draws to its sorry end it hasn't changed anything of my idea of life it only confirmed it so this is a very bleak view of humanity and one art historian referred to this picture as one of the most disagreeable image which the art of our century has to show so the picture is in a way not only autobiographical because it relates to his images of the wounded um, you'll actually notice that the scene takes place in a domestic interior and it's personal for other reasons um, okay so we see a number of intruders um, in this domestic setting um, we can see um, the members of the household so there's a man here who's being tortured you can see the rope um, tied around his neck and his sort of legs awkwardly and twisted out and this man twisting his arm um, this is a portrait of Beckman himself um, and the boy over here is young Peter Beckman who looks like he's being kidnapped he's sort of slung under the arm of this figure there is another partly seen figure behind which is very hard to discern how the figure fits in and there's a woman here who is being tied up by her wrists with her legs splayed awkwardly out so this is about torture and kidnapping and rape and possibly murder and um, the perpetrators we can see shadowy on the left hand side and more clearly in the center and on the right the central figure is actually a wounded figure with his head bandaged and this figure is, has his eyes completely sort of suppressed almost like a blinded figure um, though he's just his cap pulled down over his face but the fact that it's like a wounded man um, is the perpetrator it shows you how the artist is like compressing together and conflated the perpetrator and the victims um, so again it's meant to be somewhat personal and maybe incidents like this burnt foot um, of the man is something that he would have seen when he was at war um so it's a pretty horrifying image and it's more horrifying because of the way Beckman shows it so there's the subject which is horrifying um and it, you know it said that Beckman pulls on the notion of religious imagery imagery particularly images showing um, the torture of Christ or Christ displaying his stigmata you could see for example the way that the man in this work displays his palm and the soles of his feet um, but Beckman doesn't do that for religious reasons he does it because the themes of Christianity are heavy on themes of suffering and cruelty but it's also how Beckman shows it that makes the work so unsettling um, we do see sort of some vague sort of cubist implications only because of the flattening of space so you could see that it's a very claustrophobic environment the floor is tipped up the walls are tipped in so it it forces us to confront this image very clearly I mean the only way we can even see where we are that we're in some sort of domestic setting is because we could see like a dog maybe here and a phonograph like that we were in a house um, the other thing that makes it quite unsettling is his use of color um, which is sort of very pale um, it's sometimes the colors are described as as bitter and so between his sort of like acidic they're off colors and between those colors and um, the compressed space it makes the picture feel something like a nightmare and of course it is called Die Nacht or the night and for that reason we might think of this as as straight out of Beckman's nightmare but then uh, also to show what he perceived as the horrors of modern German life the last artist we're going to consider very briefly um, is the Dresden painter um, Otto Dix um, he is 
another artist, the third in the group who um, had military service, but he had prolific military service. He volunteered. He served on the Eastern and the Western fronts. He was awarded the Iron Cross. So he was a very active soldier, although ultimately his combat experience will make him intensely, fiercely anti-militaristic. Now, initially, he talks about going into the service, and this is something he talked about well after the fact. He gave an interview in 1963, and he said, I had to experience for myself what it is like when someone next to you falls down dead. I had to experience it totally and utterly. I wanted to. So I'm certainly not a pacifist after all. Or maybe I was a curious person. I had to see it all for myself. I'm such a realist. Um, and even though his images are particularly horrible in the way that Gross's and Beckman's are, he didn't really see it that way. He says, I never really I was never really all that interested in showing ugliness. Everything I saw, it was beautiful. Something he said towards the end of his life. Um, so he has this military background as an artist. Um, he goes through a number of styles. So early on, he's very much influenced by early German Expressionism and then Dada before he comes to associate himself with Neue Sachlichkeit. Um, and like the other artists that we've talked about for this unit, he is interested in looking back on the past of Germany. So he's very interested in old master painters, ones that we've seen like Cronach and Durer and Hans Balden Green. So these are all artists that we see a lot of the German expressionists, both before and after World War II, become interested in. Quite a few of Otto Dix's images focus on the aftermath of the war, which is sort of a very uncomfortable way to sort of politically critique war. So he focuses especially on the broken bodies of people returning from war, people who were disabled veterans. Um, this is the kind of subjects Dix likes, prostitutes, working people. Um, he's intrigued by the idea of the outsider. And so that's what this picture shows us. It shows us two war veterans who are both um, disabled with literally incomplete bodies. Um, and they are differentiated by their clothing and by their social class. So towards the bottom of the picture, we can see the sort of upper middle class officer, sort of, you know, well dressed and comparatively well cared for, who is um, sort of scooting by on a cart with wheels on it. Um, and then you can see the poorer figure in the torn clothes, which is the blind soldier who's missing his left arm and both of his feet. Um, it shows the way that these figures were left to sort of to beg. And so we can see the men, they're actually on the street called um, uh, Pregerstrasse, which is um, one of the most wealthy streets in Dresden. And you could see behind there are these shop windows. And interestingly, the shop windows are selling um, wigs on the left hand side and prosthetics and corsets, all sorts of things about bodily artifice in the windows, much nicer objects and actually objects associated with femininity and sexuality. Um, and then we see the juxtaposition with the much cruder apparatuses constructed by um, the men in the foreground. Um, as we see these men, we also see, interestingly, two other fragmented living bodies who aren't fragmented like their bodies are, but are fragmented by the frame. Um, the blind beggar in the back puts his hand out and you could see this green hand just cut off by the frame over on the left hand side get my pointer over here and you can see he's dropping into his hand a postage stamp so here you can see this man is begging and he's given something that is essentially worthless even though so many people had prospered in other ways from the war on the other side we see a fragmented body of a well-dressed sexualized female body you could see her sort of ample behind and these platform laced up shoes walking what looks like a cat. And so we see a fragmented body and a fragmented body. And again, the female body especially is sexualized like these references to corsets in the background um, in order to display their sexuality, which is really something that now is not um, accessible to the 
the emasculated figures that we see in the picture. Um, his technique is really quite interesting. We, of course, we have that compressed sort of space with overlapping, overlapping perspectives. Um, and we have these very garish colors, very acidic and bright. And they are colors that more traditionally we associate with posters and prints and commercial imagery. But those are colors that are constructed by design to lure you in. And then you are slapped in the face with this shocking image of social critique and realism. And it, this is something that's often called the aesthetic of the ugly, which is certainly a way that we could describe Dick's. What is something that's super interesting is, well, I mean, obviously the social critique is interesting. The fact that everything in the background, like the, well, at least the corsets and the wigs are about superficial, you know, superficial beauty. Um, and then in the foreground, there's the scene of, you know, the, especially the impoverished um, blind man. Um, but more than that, his technique is super interesting. Um, he looks back on the idea of cubist collage, which of course now collage is something we've also seen Dada be interested in as well. And so there are um, collage elements throughout the work. There's real human hair on the wigs. There's um, real, there's, there's tickets in the store windows that are real. There's actually a little photograph of Otto Dix himself back here. Um, the wheels on the cart are made out of tin foil, so they're applied to the surface. The stamp is real as well, as well as these torn out pieces of magazines. This one, which looks, it's being run over by the man on the cart, and it looks almost like it's being held in this barking dog's mouth, um, shows, about, it discusses really the, it says Jews out on it, and it's about the rising anti-Semitism in a, uh, Germany at the time, which Dix is taking note of. So super political, super interesting. And like we saw with Beckmann, like, and gross, difficult to look at, and an image that was meant to critique through shock. So it seems like an exaggeration. Of course, you know, this was, um, of course, Dix again said he didn't, he only painted things that were beautiful. But, you know, interestingly, there is a, an insignia on the back, um, an inscription that he wrote on the painting. And he said, dedicated to my contemporaries. So I suppose to acknowledge the state everyone is in, in, in this post-war Germany. The last work we're going to look at is a really impressive work by Dix called Der Krieg, or The War. And this is a later work, but I wanted to sort of show where Dix's style evolved to, and to show once again the relationship between these German sort of expressionist painters and the art of the past. So this is him looking back on the memory of World War I at a greater distance in 1932, but he's also doing it at a time when there's growing support for the Nazis and there's a return of this or growth of militarism in Germany. And so that too was a way of him thinking um, about, you know, making him think towards the art, not just the art of the past, but of his own past as well. You know, he was interested, like a lot of the artists we've seen this class, in Nietzsche, um, particularly Nietzsche's The Joyous Science, um, where he talks about the uh, sort of cyclical, um, the cyclical nature of life, that there's procreation and death, there's building up, there's tearing down, there's growth and decay, and war plays a role in this. Um, what's interesting about this work is it is a, a polyptic, it is a multi-paneled work, and it is very specifically modeled on late medieval and Renaissance altarpieces. Now this shows you what I mean by that, and you can see it very clearly here. Traditional altarpieces in Germany would have a central panel with folding wings on the outside, and then a panel down below, which was called the predella, which is the sort of um, support, but there's a lower picture beneath the main panel. And um, we know that Dix was very interested, and so was Beckmann, in the paintings of Matthias Grunewald, who was a German painter who painted a very sort of similar 
idea in his Isenheim altarpiece where it shows like the brutality and tortured nature of like Christ's body, like very gruesome on purpose. And that is something that absolutely um, Beckmann is picking up on here. So he models, he models his work here on a religious altarpiece, even though it's not a religious subject. Um, and he relates the panels to scenes that are very common to Christian altarpieces. So the left-hand panel, we can see um, soldiers departing for war. You see them in uniform and carrying their weapons. And we can relate this to Christ's you know, procession to Calvary, where he's carrying the cross. The central scene then becomes a crucifixion, which is very similar to what we see in Grunewald's altarpiece. And here you could see on this tree, there is this skeletal corpse with a pointing sort of accusatory finger. Uh, in this sort of um, hellscape of apocalyptic landscape with mangled bodies in the foreground. And then on the right hand side, you can see this sort of fiery apocalyptic landscape that's a lot like um, Peter Bruegel's that we looked at. Um, and this scene where you could see a body being carried, and you could see there's a tree behind, is meant to evoke the nation, the, 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 the idea, the notion of um, a deposition, Christ's body being lowered from the cross. Traditionally in Christian altar pieces like this, the predella might show the dead Christ in his tomb. Um, and here instead we see soldiers sleeping in this confined space, either dead or sleeping, we don't really know. Um, but again, coming back to that religious kind of iconography. Um, but even though this is based on religious imagery, there is no hope for salvation suggested here. So that we know Dix talks about war and his interest in it. And he said, the war was a horrible thing, but there was something tremendous about it too. You have to have seen human beings in this unleashed state to know what human nature is. I need to experience all the depths of life for myself. And that's why I go out. And that's why I volunteered. Um, this is also slightly autobiographical as a work, and you'll notice on the right hand side there is a sort of ghostly figure, um, whether it's ghost or light or ash, that's carrying this body in the landscape, and that is a self-portrait of Dix, so he relates the work back to himself. Um, no surprise that his works, like the works of Beckmann, were declared to be degenerate. And Hitler said of his works and those of his compatriots, it's a shame one cannot put these people behind bars. So that's where we're going to lead this. I know this was a lot of information, but you see such wonderful stuff. And next week we'll be on to something totally new.